Welcome to The Difference Makers, a Paladin Security Podcast. We'll take you inside the world of security and share firsthand expertise from our industry professionals. Join us as we dive into everything security and explore the journeys of those who go above and beyond to make our world a safer and friendlier place. Welcome to The Difference Makers. I'm Christina Hidanis. March is Women's History Month, with the theme being women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Our guest is someone who has risen up the ranks in the HR realm and fought for inclusion. Susan Eibach brings 25 years of experience to her role as Executive Vice President of People and Culture for Paladin Security, with remarkable accomplishments in large-scale acquisitions, labor relations, and most recently, leading the efforts in hiring for thousands of positions at Paladin Airport Security. Security. In this month's podcast, Susan discusses what she's learned along the way, the barriers she's faced, and how she promotes inclusion in the workplace. Here is Susan Eibach. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Christine. I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm really excited to dive in to learn more about you because you joined Paladin in um, September of 2023, so a few months ago. Um, And you have a really long career, 25 years plus, in uh, human resources. Uh, What drove you to pursue a career in HR? Great question. And actually, I kind of fell into HR, if I'm perfectly honest. I went to university in Lethbridge to take my bachelor of management degree. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do as a major and started taking some variety of courses in management. And I found that I really enjoyed the courses as part of the HR major, which was around employee and labor relations, as well as some courses that really talked about what motivates people and how do they find their passion and organizational structure. And I just found that I gravitated towards them, maybe because I wasn't as strong at the accounting side, I gravitated to the other ones. But I found that I really enjoyed the courses in the program. And then that kind of translated to a career after I graduated. I found my first job as a kind of a temporary mat leave entry level HR role. And I re- I learned a lot. I would say that it was an eye opening experience having never worked in a corporate environment before, but I loved it. I loved learning about programs to support our people and how to motivate them and ensure that our employees are taken care of. And it, just kind of went from there. And uh, through the course of the 24 years, I've had the opportunity to oversee or work in multiple functions within HR, whether it's talent acquisition or developing employee programs, engagement, labor relations, all, all elements. And I just was able to gain this breadth of experience, which has really helped me grow my career. And I just always found it super interesting and enjoyed Enjoyed the space. Yeah, for sure. So give me a brief overview of the steps or of the uh, different uh, careers that you, not careers, I guess, but the different roles that you had within HR over the last 25 so years. Sure, sure. I, like I said, I started as an entry level, predominantly um, just talent acquisition and doing recruiting for a call center was my primary responsibility as part of this mat leave contract. And when that was done, I had some connections and found out about a job at Shaw and I moved over and took that role. And again, similar entry level, I was responsible for overseeing disability management and some of our employee programs, um, such as share purchase plan and different things like that and our benefits. And we had a small HR team, so I had an opportunity to get involved in a lot of projects. We were in an acquisition mode as an organization, so it was kind of all hands on deck whenever Whenever things came up, I got to jump in and through that, I got exposure to different elements such as employee relations and some of working with our employment labor lawyer and understood that side of it and just kind of broadened my career and had an opportunity to take on a leadership role after a number of years um, overseeing some of the HR team and continue just to kind of move around and take on different portfolios, eventually took safety um, training at one point. And I just enjoyed the breadth and being able to learn different things. And I found through my career, some of the stuff that I did early on or our benefits, I leveraged throughout my career. So it was always good to have that breadth of knowledge. And like I said, had the opportunity to work on a lot of acquisition and divestitures. 
which gave me exposure to different parts of the company and different leaders throughout the company and it just allowed me to grow. And so I moved from management to a director level position after a number of years and eventually in the last kind of seven or eight years was promoted to vice president and eventually senior vice president. Okay. Um, yeah, that's quite the, <laughs> that, that's quite the, um, I guess, adventure that you've been on within uh, HR. So um, when you joined security, obviously security is a very different beast than, you know, telecommunications and, and that type of thing. So um, how did you handle the, you know, was it a steep learning curve or how did you um, handle like jumping to a different company after being with one for so long that, you know, you knew the ins and outs of so well? So being new is certainly different for me, having been at one company for 24 years. But the, I think the fundamentals of HR are are generally the same. So that foundation really helped me. It was a, cer- certainly an interesting learning experience to learn about a different industry that was very different from the telecom world that I had come from. And so I've just kind of embraced the fact that I was new and this was going to be a a period of learning for me and um, I could leverage my HR knowledge to help provide guidance on in general terms, maybe not specifically as it related to the industry, but slowly as I've learned more about the industry, I'm now able to marry the functional experience with the kind of industry specific information and able to provide some more support. So Every company is different. Every industry is different. It's about taking the time to understand the business. That's that's a professional's job is you're not going to be good at HR if you don't understand the business. So really taking the time to understand the business and then bringing your HR expertise to the table as well. For sure. Now, the security industry um, is more of a male dominated industry, um, especially at the top, at the top level. So do you find that's the case coming in from, say, telecommunications to be coming an EVP um, in within the industry? Or do you feel like it is pretty balanced or there is um, a lot of progression that has been made? I would say that I can see that there is a it's more of a male dominated industry. However, there's certainly some progression and I'm certainly not the only senior leader in the organization uh, uh, who's a female. So I can see the work that Paladin's been doing to really increase representation for women. And I think some of it comes from the stereotypes of security and men. Um, but I, but there's a lot of great work that's been done to kind of break some of that down. And I look around when I'm in the office and I see both genders, wide variety of people. So I, I think that's great progress. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. Um, now, you did mention that you were part of a lot of, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions and and things like that. So was there ever a time maybe earlier on in your career that you didn't that you may have not felt that you that you belonged or that you needed to prove yourself um, or like how did you kind of overcome that or or, or um, establish your presence within, um, you know, the the space that you that you were in? Sure. And so on the acquisitions and divestitures, I was fortunate to always be on the acquiring side. So it's a very different world when you're being the acquirer versus the acquired. In the last couple of years, though, obviously, I worked with an organization organization that was acquired by a larger company. And um, certainly, it's a it's a scary time for employees when you're being purchased because you know your world is going to change, different leaders, different processes, all of that type of thing. And I think the important part, and even myself, I had to tell myself, you know, your work generally speaks for yourself. Be confident in in the work that you do. Don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. And also be courageous enough to make the decision that's right for you. If if this is not the right place for you, be courageous enough to make that decision or be courageous enough to go out on a limb and say, I know this is different. Let's see if this was could be good for me or, or work for me. And let's see if this is an opportunity for me to learn and expand my experience. For sure. Uh, now, one of our colleagues in uh, Pal American, um, her name is Anjana Yeber, she was telling me that when she was in her career, um, earlier on in her career, um, she was she found that in order to be heard, she had to listen to people and then um, figure out their issues and then find a way to address them. And that was her secret to success to be able to move up in her career. What would you say would be your secret to success? I would say it's probably not just one thing, but hers was definitely a great one. Um, 
I, I think the key is, you know, being confident in yourself. I would say early on in my career, I was maybe scared to stick my neck out and give my thoughts or my recommendations for fear that people wouldn't agree with them. And I actually received some really great feedback from someone once who said to me, you know, it's better to have a position or opinion or make a recommendation than just not have one. People are going to take you more seriously if you come prepared. And here's why I think it should be. Generally, you're going to come with sound reasoning, not just a random thought, right? And not everybody's going to agree with your position, but that's okay. It's better to have one than not have one at all. And if they don't agree with your position, be open to learn to maybe why and be flexible to move forward. But it, them not agreeing with you doesn't mean you've done something wrong or there shouldn't be a reason not to provide it in the future. So that actually gave me a little bit more confidence to be in a position to um, speak up and share my views because I felt like I did have the experience to make recommendations going forward. And I think maybe the other one is to have allies throughout the organization. It's often easy to have a close peer group within your own department, um, people who are advocate for you, but you need to have allies throughout the organization, people who will vouch for you, people who can say, yeah, I know this person does great work and here's why. So it, building those relationships and having that internal network in your organization is super important and critical. I love that. Who have been some of your allies over your, your career? Um, I've had a few. Uh, some of them have been my direct leaders and others have been individuals that I've worked with. Um, early in my career, my we had a very small department and my VP, my fir very first VP. I learned a lot from her from a subject matter expertise perspective. Um, I was new in HR learning and she really took the time to explain the why of things, which I, which I really appreciated and it just helped give me more foundation as an understanding, it was not just this is how you do it, it's here's why you do it this way and give me that space. Um, I think another one was probably one of the more influential ones was I had the opportunity probably mid-career to be on the uh, bargaining committee with um, uh, one of our senior vice presidents and he had done this for many years and no one in HR had ever been invited to be part of the bargaining committee before. And he was generally a very quiet man who didn't have a lot to say, but when he spoke, he was, he, people took him seriously because he was very thoughtful in what he said. And so I essentially traveled the country with him for two years in bargaining. And I took that opportunity to ask him questions whenever we had some downtime. And he was always very patient. He always took the time to explain. He would give me feedback on how I handled situations and I, he's been retired for 10 or so years and we still keep in contact because he ju I just really appreciated the quiet support that he provided and the fact that he didn't really have to take a chance on me because I was the HR person coming into this bargaining. I had no bargaining experience and he supported and embraced me and helped me grow in that in my career. That's amazing. Um I want to, it kind of made me think about sponsoring and mentoring, um, two important, you know, things that women should, should, um, I guess, take part in or, or consider in their careers. Um, do either one of you, does, do either one of those connect with you or do you feel passionate about either one that, um, you're actively doing that within the organizations that you're in? Sure. I, I, I'm a firm believer in mentoring and I think, you can do it in a couple of ways. Most of my, I've been involved in both structured mentoring programs as well as kind of informal mentoring programs. Um, I found for my, myself personally, I found I've got the most out of the more informal ones based on relationships that I developed or situations such as the bargaining experience happened. However, everybody learns differently or accepts information differently. The, through the structured program, I got to be involved with folks that maybe I didn't know as well. And I learned some different things from them that I maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity to. So through my career, I've had a number of people who basically have come and said, I don't necessarily need a formal mentor, but I would all, I would appreciate if we could chat maybe quarterly or, or on a monthly basis, just so I can just run some ideas by you or just hear what you're doing or pick your brain on something. And so that's really been 
most of my mentoring experience is there's been a handful of people throughout my career in in HR and outside of HR that I've kind of had regular connects with and and just some of it's just building relationships and some of it's providing support or some insights on what's worked for myself. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you said that um, some of them were inside of HR and some of them weren't. Like, do you think it's important to be able to um, even go outside of your own realm and, and seek support if it's someone that you admire? Yes, I think I think that's so important. Going back to my comment about having allies outside of your own function and even outside of your organization, I found over the past probably ten years, I spent more time doing external networking. I'm an introvert by nature, so networking is not something that I actively seek out on a regular basis. But I have been in more involved in some some either women's groups or business groups and just having an external network and building some of those relationships so that you can provide support to them or they can provide support to you. It's just good to have that balance. And I often find in mentoring relationships, the mentor gets as much out of the relationship as the mentee in a lot of cases. I know I have. Yeah, that's true. That is something that I didn't really consider, but it feels like it would be that way, especially with, you know, generations changing and, and things like that. So um, I wanted to kind of ask you about any barriers or struggles that you may have had. Um, I know you, you mentioned a few earlier, but um, if was there any is there any one that stands out in your head that um, you're like, yeah, that was, you know, a, a kind of a, a big struggle that I had and this is what I did to overcome it? I think and probably the biggest one was for me was being part of the bargaining committee, um, being asked that it would ha- had very traditionally been operations leaders in, in generally males because the bargaining committee that I was a part of was bargaining for a group of technicians who was predominantly men. Uh, so I, at the bargaining table, I was generally one of a very few number of women and it was also a world that maybe I wasn't as familiar with on the technical side. So some of the, some of the barriers was my own confidence. If I'm perfectly honest, it was because anybody said you shouldn't be here or why are you here? You're a woman, you're in HR, you don't know anything about technicians. It was more about that I wasn't the subject matter expert in that area. So I maybe felt that I didn't have as much to offer And so wasn't willing to initially maybe speak up a little bit and just being intimidated by the fact that I was in a group of mostly men, rations in an area that wasn't my my area of expertise. So I would say probably the biggest barrier for me was myself and just finding the confidence that there's that I'm there for a reason. I was chosen to be part of this for a reason and that I have value to bring. Maybe it looks a little different than other folks contributed, but I had the ability to do it. So, and some of it was encouragement from the um, individual that I spoke about earlier and just in him encouraging me that, you know, you're, you're on the right track, you're saying the right things, you're contributing in the right way, keep doing it and building that confidence. And I found that I just, I never was really put in a spot that someone said, no, you shouldn't be here because of your religion or anything like that. So, I mean, I feel fortunate in my career that I didn't really experience a lot of gender-based barriers. Um, and generally, if I did, it was partly, partially my own confidence. Right. And I think that's common with women, um, you know, never thinking they know enough or they deserve to be there or anything like that. So how long did it take for you to, you know, gain that confidence to be like, OK, yes, I deserve to be here. I know what I'm talking about. It you know surprisingly it doesn't take that long and you know you just had a couple of small wins or I brought things up that people maybe didn't had considered or weren't looking at it from a different angle because I was looking at it from a non operational angle and I could see that I was adding value and so you just kind of gain that confidence over time. It wasn't, it wasn't years. It was more like months. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Well, it's nice that you haven't had any gender, I guess, stereotypes um, or too many to deal with throughout your career. Um, I do want to know though, like what do you do to promote inclusion in in the workplace? It is one of the themes for this year's um, Women's History Month. So um, what are some things that you may do to, to promote that? Um, so 
I guess I could look at it formally or informally. In the past, I I've taken the time to participate in kind of employee resource groups so that have promoted whether I'm punk or or women and just learning. I think the key piece is creating awareness in yourself and making sure that you understand what's important, what are some of the social issues out there. And then as you're doing your work, find ways to ensure that that's encapsulated or captured. Like when we launch a new employee program or communication or anything related to it, is the language inclusive? Does it do we, do we take steps to ensure that people won't feel excluded or feel that they can't be part of that program because it has maybe barriers that people hadn't seen? Um, and really just fostering an environment where I have an open door and people can can come and talk to me and raise issues. And I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty good listener and I'm willing to um, be a safe space for people to to talk to or bring for, concerns forward and then hopefully address them. For sure. Um, how has how much has HR changed over the years when it comes to um you know, what's okay and what's not and inclusion and diversity. And and you kind of mentioned like the wording and different documents and stuff like that. Like how much has it evolved over the years? I would say in my career, it had, it's increased or the awareness has increased exponentially. I would say when I started, it, the, it was the basics of we have to report to the government from an employment equity perspective with little little around that in terms of what does that actually mean? What programs, how do you actually foster this, this environment to um, a real focus? And not, not because it's something that companies have to do, but it's something that they should do and they're better for doing it. Um, create, having an environment where people of all kinds have the safe space to be able to participate and contribute. You're always going to get a better outcome if you have different perspectives contributing to a, um, an initiative or an idea or a program than if you have all of the same people who think the same way and look the same way and feel the same way, right? It's actually great to see how much it's come, particularly in the last number of years. And it has to be less about this is a program that we're doing. This is how we operate. This is just what's important to us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I want to touch on Paladin Airport Security. Um, Paladin um, Airport Security recently was rewarded uh, the contracts for CATSA uh, screening at the airports for the Pacific and Prairie region. Um, this is you know, a new contract for um, for Paladin. And so what goes into uh, kind of building this new organization and hiring as many people as we need to hire and kind of learning about a new area, which is airport screening, um, you know, from from your end, you've been very involved in this from from the start of it. Yeah, it's been a very exciting couple of months. And a lot of key elements is really we're setting up an, a new organization within the Paladin Security Group. And it's really been building on the fat, great foundation that Paladin has around the culture piece. And then how do we translate this to this new organization in terms of creating um, pol our policy and employee manuals? How do we leverage that great culture from, from Paladin and set up the kind of rules of engagement or the way we'll operate in an employee manual? As well, we've had the opportunity to meet hundreds of, um, of employees that currently do the screening services. And it's it's been an, actually an incredible kind of experience just to learn from them what screening services is all about, what do they experience on a day-to-day -day basis, what what are their concerns, what, what excites them about doing their job. And so we've been thoughtful about how do we bring the right team on so that when we get um, a bringing over a lot of that knowledge and experience that has made them successful to date. But then how do we also, you know, bring in some new and fresh ideas and some people from Paladin and some external folks to really kind of continue to evolve and move that business forward. So but we've had a, to do a lot of great things around people programs and getting them stood up fairly quickly to bring everybody on and really looking forward to having everybody come on in on April 1st. 
Yeah, it's very exciting. It's a it's a very exciting time. <laughs> Every day there feels like there's something new to a new challenge to kind of tackle. So, um, all right. So we're going to, um, I guess, wrap up in a little bit. But I just wanted to ask you uh, two more questions. Um, what would you say is one of your proudest moment uh, moments uh, throughout your career so far? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say it was an uh, initiative that I worked on. We were acquiring a company when I was at Shaw, and it was still confidential. So there was a very small group of us that were working on it. And there was a lot of kind of unique intricacies of the people programs and the executive arrangements at this organization. And Quite frankly, I had no knowledge of how to roll up in the stock option plan, share plan, and what would be the implications. And I was responsible for ensuring that everything was done as it relates to that. And I had the opportunity, essentially, I had to bring together the legal, the tax groups, and get all of the parties in a room so that we could figure out how to resolve this matter and get it in a in a in a format that we could give to these employees, these executives coming on. And I think it wasn't a big thing per se, but I think I was probably most proud because when I started, I didn't really know anything about this space and was able to use my relationships and my past knowledge to be able to get to a place where we were in a position to resolve this matter and be able to bring everybody on smoothly and seamlessly and where everyone was happy and at a place where we could kind of move forward. And that was a key part of getting the deal across the the finish line in order to be able to announce it. So I think it was just more where I started and where I ended up through the process that I think I'm most proud of. Oh, that's awesome. That's always nice to to have that like struggle that you know, but everyone else is confident that you can do it. And then you're like, in your head, you're probably like, ah, I don't know. And then you end up doing it. And you're like, okay, see, I can do it. <laughs> so, um, okay. So I'm going to wrap up by asking um, for any advice you'd like to give someone, um, regardless, I guess, of their industry or their, uh, you know, department they work in. Um, but any advice of someone who maybe wants to kind of rise up the ranks and have, uh, you know, a similar career path to to you, or they just want to, you know, become a manager or whatever they want they want to do. Sure. I have a couple kind of pieces of advice. I would say challenge yourself to take risks, push yourself out of your comfort zone. In my experience, I the biggest reward came from the times that I was most scared or took on challenges that I didn't think I was capable of doing. And I was able to prove to myself that I was. And it was those opportunities or initiatives or projects that actually allowed me to kind of grow in my career, grow in my confidence, grow in my career, and gave me exposure to maybe different people that hadn't I hadn't worked with previously. So, you know, be confident in yourself and take those risks. And then going back to my point earlier is find your allies and find your mentors. Um, allies are good to have as kind of sounding boards for ideas and and. and um, checking to see if you're on the right path or going in the right direction and then mentors to really help guide you and really give you some insightful advice on how what's worked for them or what what you could potentially do to further your career so those are the two pieces of advice that I would give to quite frankly anybody who's looking to grow in their career I love that that's really great Thank you so much, Susan, for joining us. It was so nice to hear your story and, you know, everything you've been through and all the accomplishments you made. And it's very inspiring. And um, the advice, the advice you have given to is, uh, is really great. So thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time today. Hey, Thanks for tuning in with The Difference Makers. If you want to hear more about the ins and outs of the security industry from real professionals, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share. Also, check out new episodes on the first Tuesday of every month. Till next time. (laughs) 